Today we are going to be speaking about some bills that are coming forth in the Parliament there in Canada. And on November 28th, they'll be doing the second reading of Bill C-428. This is in front of the first session, the 41st, the 41st Parliament, which I describe as declaring war on our First Nations. Bill C-428 is the enactment amendment of the Indian Act to require band councils to publish their bylaws and repeal certain outdated provisions of the Act. It also requires the Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs to report annually to the House of Commons Committee responsible for original, Aboriginal Affairs on the work undertaken by his or her department in collaboration with First Nation organizations and other interest parties to develop new legislation to replace the Indian Act. We're going to get back to um, Bill C-428, but first I want to read directly from Pam Palmater's um, Indigenous Nationhood dot blogspot dot com. Pam's got a great article here, and I do want to address it and then use it as the format to move forward. So Bill S-2, the Family Homes on Reserve and Matrimonial Rights Are Interest Act. Harper's conserv conservatives have given the signal that they may once again refocus their legislative eye on Bill S-2, Family Homes on Reserve, Matrimonial Interest and Rights Act, otherwise known as the MRP Bill. To this end, the parties have been preparing to study the bill and hear from witness on, on possible amendments. Most of Canada's legislative initiatives go largely unexplained to grassroots Indigenous people, community members, and leaders alike. This Harper government, in particular, has done, enough, has done everything it can to mislead, misinform, distract, confuse, and outright lie to First Nations about its intentions with regards to the Indian Act. More so, they have done very little to explain the implications of the bills to those who will be impacted, First Nation community members. Most will recall part, uh, Prime Minister Harper's infamous words at the so-called Crown First Nations gathering this past January. To be sure, our government has no grand scheme to unilaterally repeal or to unilaterally amend the Indian Act, yet there is, ex there is an extensive list of government bills currently before Parliament which were unilaterally repeal a fundamental alter the Indian Act in, in significant ways. These bills include Bill C-27, First Nations Financial Transparency Act, Bill S-2 that we just talked about, the Family Homes and Reserves, Matrimonial Interest, Our Rights Act, Bill S-6, First Nations Election Act, Bill S-8, Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act, Bill S-207, an act to amend the Interpretation Act. This does not include many of the anon of the anonymous bills of other our other bills which impact First Nations. There are two other bills expected to be introduced in the new year as well. First Nation Property Ownership Act and First Nation Educational Act. So with that said, I do want to introduce our guest um to Fire Talk. She um has been on our show several times and has brought great clarity to the issues that we spoke on. So um, Pam Palmeter is joining us again today, who is an associate professor and the author of Beyond, I'm sorry, Beyond Blood, Rethinking Indigenous Identity. So with that said, I do want to welcome Pam to the show. Pam, welcome back, sister. Well, Lal and Russ for having me. We really want to thank you for coming. But let's, let's hit it right off the bat. That's what me and you seem to do. We yep. seem to come to air, and we hit it right away. So what is Bill C-27, First Nations Financial Transparency Act? Okay, well, I mean, first and foremost, it was it's a bill designed to do nothing more than perpetuate the myth that all First Nations are corrupt and that we're the authors of our own poverty. So if you look at the bill, it's supposed to be about transparency and accountability. So the presumption is that there isn't any transparency and accountability, so of course we have to have this act. But of course that's just the, you know, Harper conservative ruse has everybody distracted arguing over whether or not First Nations are corrupt, but what's actually in the bill is a violation of their rights. So for example, it says that financial audited statements have to be uh, submitted yearly. And of course Canadians would think, well of course, well, and they are. 
they are submitted yearly or they wouldn't get a single cent from their band transfer payments. But by putting that in there, you make it uh, look like First Nations don't submit their audits, and of course they do. Um, and the other thing is that uh, – Chiefs and councils have to submit their schedule of remuneration, which, you know, seems fair, salary and expenses. However, it has to include all businesses, which, of course, for anybody else in Canada or any other uh, major state, you don't have to submit your business um, information publicly. So, for example, think of Prime Minister Paul Martin. When he did his statement of remuneration every year as Prime Minister, he didn't also have to include all of his privately owned businesses. And this is what it's requiring First Nations to do. And think about what that actually does. That actually forces First Nations to divulge all of their confidential, um, copyright, patented, trademark information for the public which gives them no competitive advantage whatsoever. And the other thing it does is it really interferes with their own governance. It requires them to publish all of that information on the Internet, and it must stay up for a minimum of 10 years. And if they fail to do so, INAC is giving themselves the ability to take them to court. And if they refuse to do so, they won't get any of their funding. So imagine if on a principle of sovereignty you said, listen, you're going to get my audits, but I'm not publishing it on the Internet because we don't have any duty to the Canadian public. It's not the public that votes for us. It's our members. Then Indian Affairs and the minister has already testified in Senate that he would cut the funding to that First Nation. Imagine the crisis yeah. that would create. Yeah. You know, Pam, the next thing you're going to tell me is they're going to put someone in charge to, to overlook this in the capacity of an Indian agent. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know? the AFN is calling for a First Nation auditor, so, yeah, you know, the two is. kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Let's talk about um, this one, really. This one really got, gets me going. Let's talk about Bill S-2, the Family Homes and Reserve Matrimonial Interest and Rights Act. Explain that to us so we can get into that one a little bit. Okay, so here's another one where the conservative government highlights some unassailable value, or, you know, like this bill is going to protect Indigenous women from violence. This bill is going to give equality to Indigenous women. And really, this bill has nothing to do with that because it's all about uh, spouses' rights after they've already broken up or after they've already um, divorced. So what, it's, what it purports to do is it assumes the jurisdiction of the federal government to enact laws on reserve over matrimonial real property, who gets to stay in the house, who gets to use the land, and that kind of thing. Um, and what they're saying is if any First Nation already has matrimonial real property laws, they refuse to recognize them, and only the federal laws will apply. If you ever want to have your own MRP laws, you have to go under the federal process. So that's, I mean, it's clearly an invasion into our inherent right to be self-determining. But here's the other thing. This bill has nothing at all to deal with the division of property between um, First Nation spouses, uh, men and women. This has everything to do with giving non-Indians access to our homes and lands because it, for the first time in history, is saying non-Indians get to use, occupy, and potentially transfer both the home and the land on reserve. And you think, okay, why would that be a concern? Well, the majority of bands in this country have moderate to high outmarriage rates, and you can imagine how quickly our reserve lands could be gone in a second, especially if you tie this bill to the First Nation Property Ownership Act, which is purporting to allow uh, sale to non-Indians. So if you have possession by non-Indians and you allow sale to non-Indians, our reserves could be gone quicker than you could blink. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that's what's got me so upset about this bill, that a native who marries a non-native who then returns back to the community and lives on reserve land, if there's a problem within that marriage and there is a dissolve of that marriage, then the non-native has as much rights on reserve than the member themselves. You're and, absolutely and right. The first time ever that they're adding non-natives into the Indian Act. 
Yeah, and it violates Canadian law. So if you only, mm-hmm. like, you know, if you set aside our Indigenous laws, which are primary, and you only look at indig- or, um, Canadian law, under the Indian Act, only an Indian can be in possession of a home or land on reserve. That's federal Absolutely. law. And even more than that, many of the treaty or many of the reserves in this country are recognized and set up via treaties, which are now protected under the Indian Act. You cannot unilaterally amend a treaty to uh, open up reserve lands to non-Indians. That would be violating Section 35 of the Constitution. So at every stage of federal law, it's breached. They're not even designing legislation that won't be in conflict with their own laws. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so once again, a division of laws to regulate. Yeah, the and, and what they're the saying, the like, if I testified, I testified in Senate over this, and some of the comments and questions were, were absolutely crazy. What they were saying is, okay, well, here's the choice. Either First Nation women get thrown out of their house in the middle of the night, or they have MRP, federal MRP legislation. So, first of all, you have to presume that every woman gets thrown out in the middle of the night, right. and that's simply not the case. And First Nations men and women have rights to the division of property on reserve as it is now. And if not, then they can go to court and apply for compensation in lieu, you know, instead of. Mm -hmm. So once you strip Mm -hmm. away all of the myths of this bill, there's only one thing that stands out, and that is to transfer all of our lands to non-Indians. And that's something they don't have the right to do. Yeah, I agree, one hundred percent. That that law, when I when I when I was reading that bill, it grabbed hold of me, and I said, absolutely not. That's why I call these declarations of war once again on our First Nations. Bill S six, First Nations Election Act. Why don't you enlighten us on that one? Okay, well, doesn't it sound like it would be a bill about First Nation elections, right? Yeah, it sounds um, like it. This, <laughs> This is something that that came out of a partnership with um, a few First Nations and Indian Affairs. They wanted to have uh, reforms to the election provisions under the Indian Act uh, because, for example, chiefs only hold tenure for or term of office for two years, and they wanted to expand it and that kind of thing. So what Indian Affairs does is it takes that opportunity about what First Nations wanted, um, longer terms and Uh, a much easier uh, process and less Indian Affairs involvement. And what Uh Indian Affairs does is creates this piece of legislation that actually has more Indian Affairs authority over the First Nations and creates new ways to imprison our people. So right now, you know in Canada, the statistics are Indigenous peoples are overrepresented at all levels, both men, women, and youth in federal and provincial institutions, and it's on the rise. Um, The the correctional investigator has said it's a crisis. Well, here we have a piece of legislation that's saying um, if you are deemed, in terms of Indian affairs, deeming you to be interfering in an election in any way, so think of someone protesting, you know, irregularities or something, you could get a $5,000 fine and go to prison. So hey, as if what are we going to do? What, what are we going to do about those chiefs knocking on our door asking for our, our offering favors for election? What's what's going to happen with that? <laughs> well, that's not dealt with under the First Nation elections. Keep in mind, there's Section 74 of the Indian Act that allows okay. uh, First uh, Indian Affairs to remove chiefs if they're you know there's found to be corrupt activity or that kind of thing but the decision making is always in Indian affairs hands it's not in the community's hands and it's not in any of the leadership's hands and the other thing here is that INAC will get to make all of the regulations for elections under this new act and INAC without without proving in a base in a court or with any evidence can force Indian Act elections on First Nations if they consider there to be a protracted leadership dispute. And we all know in Canada where they've done that. Any First Nation that has protested against mining or timber, they have 
change their traditional custom elected council and put in Indian Act uh, councils. So this is actually worse legislation than the Indian Act. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that one, I'm going to tell you, when we read this, and I think I read this somewhere in one of your blogs, that uh, these labels that they give these bills make it sound like they're actually coming in to help and to do something where actually they're coming in to take more power, take rights away and and and, and infiltrate more power from their side. Yeah, and, and even – and they're also transferring jurisdiction because if there's any contested elections, it goes to provincial court to be disputed. Right? So now you've got provincial yeah. laws, rules, ideologies being applied on First Nation elections interfered with by Indian Affairs. And the other part about it is, guess how you get to opt into these rules? By BCR, oh. and that's Ban Council Resolution. So that's just Chief and Council getting you in. But once you're in, you can only opt out by referendum. So it's a way of trapping First Nations into that legislation. Yeah. Let's uh, let's move on to Bill S. Um, Bill S. Eight, the Safe Drinking Water for First Nations Act. What's going on there? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like safe drinking water? <laughs> yeah. And, you know and what? I, in my in my thinking, Pam, I, I I have to stop and think in common sense. We need an act to ensure safe drinking water. That's the first impression I get off that. So what yeah. is it? Yeah, well, and, and what you're doing is you're appealing to the Canadian public who is not going to take two seconds to actually read the body of the legislation and think about our community members, right? Some of yeah. which who only speak their first language, some of which, most of which I'm sure, don't sit around and read legislation all the time. So you've got this bill, yeah. F8, that says safe drinking water on First Nations, and it has nothing to do with providing safe drinking water, with giving funding to address um, the contaminated water or the lack of sanitation on reserve. What it does do is it allows the federal government to make all the regulations with regards to training, construction, distribution, monitoring, remediation, and it gives the federal government, its this, I mean, it's conferring this power on itself, the power to give any other body in Canada power over that First Nation water system. And this one, just like the election bill, also includes fines and imprisonment if you fail to do these things or interfere in any way. And worse than that, they're also giving themselves the power to search and detain and seize and all of those things. And it incorporates all the provincial laws on reserve. And here's the clincher. You have no choice to do what needs to be done on reserve with regards to water, or the federal government will do it, take it away from your banned funding, whether you have it or not, and they get to save themselves harmless, which means they're putting in a piece of legislation, even if we screw it up, we're not liable. Wow. So how's that for a piece of legislation? Doesn't do a darn thing to actually improve water. Not at all. No. Bill S two oh seven, an act to amend the interpretation act. That one confuses yeah. me just with its title. Yeah, so this one is um it's it's really small. It's it's just the statutory interpretation act which talks about how to uh interpret uh, federal statutes, and so they have an interpretation act so that you are interpreting them consistently. And what they're proposing to do is add a section that says no section, um, no enactment, so no piece of federal legislation will be allowed to abrogate or derogate from Aboriginal and treaty rights under Section 35 of the Constitution. So that sounds really great, right? And many First Nations have been calling for like a massive audit of all of the legislation to see if, if it's in line with 35. And in some circumstances, it can be okay. However, you have to remember what Section 35 actually does to our rights. So first of all, it takes our inherent sovereignty and rights and puts it under Canadian law to be interpreted by Canadian judges, as you know. Mm-hmm. The kind of, there's five trends in terms of Section 35 cases. One, they always protect Canadian sovereignty. So that's an end game right there. The other thing that judges... Sorry? No, I said you're right, absolutely. 
Yeah, yeah. And so the other thing that it, these Section 35 cases do is they make up new law to ensure that our rights, even if they trump Canadian law, get squeezed in and under and limited by Canadian law. So if, just look at all of the hunting and fishing cases so far, right, since Sparrow mm -hmm. right on up until now. All of those cases have transformed sovereign Indigenous nations into cultural entities that must be reconciled with Canadian sovereignty. So what we're talking about are cultural practices, not laws, governments, business, trade, and all of those things that are essential to maintaining our nations. It's all about songs, dances, food, and social and ceremonial purposes. And you'll recall, because you're from the Maritimes, even when, a, even when a case does go in our favor, specific to Section 35, we're the only ones in this country who are subject to rehearing. Remember Marshall? It came out and said we had a treaty right to hunt and fish um, and, and sell it. And Marshall, too, limited that to eels. So if you look at if you look at the whole gener like if you look at the whole genesis of Section 35, which is what they're trying to make sure that all of this legislation matches Section 35. We went in Sparrow from being the Indians had the first priority over everything except conservation, all the way to Delgamuk, which makes us the last priority after agriculture, forestry, mining, hydroelectric power, infrastructure, and settlement. So. Then when you come back to the Statutory Interpretation Act and say, okay, we want to make sure all laws confirm with Section 35, why on earth would I want these laws to confirm, to confirm with Section 35 when Section 35 is what's killing our rights? Yeah. But you kind of have to know all of the back Supreme Court of Canada case law to kind of get that. You wouldn't get that just from this bill. Yeah, you know, and that's what I'm noticing. <clears throat> To a lot of these bills. To read these bills, it it's very confusing because the words aren't words that your normal everyday person is going to read. So you're reading words that you're really not understanding what the what the background of those words are or, or what the intention of them are, and it's it's um it's very it's very convoluting when you read yeah, these well, because I, you because you don't know exactly. the intention. And, and the other thing that's really bad about this is our First Nation leaders aren't getting properly briefed on these things. Um, I mean, they're inundated with endless emails and updates. But in terms of actually going through each act and looking what it's proposing to do and what the potential impacts are. But some First Nations do, depending on what their regional organization is, how much they do. But then think about the community members. You know, the government is more than happy that they don't go out and talk to any of the community members who are the last people to know what's going to happen. So how on earth are they supposed to give any input or direction to their leaders if the community members don't know? And right now, there's like a flood of legislation. So it's hard enough trying to understand one piece. Imagine all of these pieces of legislation plus the two new ones they're going to be having. It's, it's overwhelming, and what you're doing is you're not giving people free, informed, and prior consent. You're just okay. naming a bunch of acts with great names on it, you know, elections, safe water, accountability, you know, homes on the res, and you think, oh, okay, that all sounds really great, until you actually see what's in it. And then you see the, where the Trojan horse comes in. Okay. Listen, all these bills and all these acts that we just talked about, what percentage of these bills or acts have had the consultation and the communication between our 630 plus First Nation uh, chiefs or our, our governments. None. None. That, that's another part of the problem. So Canada just introduces this legislation and says, yeah, you're going to just have to be a part of the parliamentary process like everyone else. But we have sovereign nations in this country, and the Mi'kmaq Nation wasn't consulted legally on any of these things. So, I mean, I have a problem with the whole duty to consult anyway because it assumes that they have the sovereignty and we're just begging them to make amendments. But right. you know, if, if you set aside our inherent sovereignty for a second, uh, which is first and prior and counteracts all that stuff, and you just focus on Canadian law, 
Supreme Court of Canada says any decision or action which could potentially impact our Aboriginal and Treaty rights, there must be consultation and accommodation. And for all of these bills, there's been no legal consultation. And you know why? Because the federal government's legal position is that we have no duty to consult or accommodate on legislation. And, and th that's just an arbitrary position on their part. And so they don't. They don't ever consult on, a, uh, on legislation. Huh. Let's, um, let's talk about these other two, and, and then I want to bring it into another direction. Um, let's talk about the First Nation Property Ownership Act. Oh, boo. <laughs> okay, so the First Nation Property Ownership Act is something that hasn't been introduced yet, but which the minister says will be introduced in the new year. Uh, the interesting thing about that bill is that it, the idea actually comes from uh, Tom, well, it's quite an old idea, but if you look at it more recently, it actually comes from Tom Flanagan. He's a non-native academic who wrote a book called Beyond the Indian Act, Restoring Aboriginal Property Rights. Now, if you know anything about Tom Flanagan at all, his first book, which was called First Nations Second Thoughts, was all about how to best assimilate Indians, but it, because he considered us primitive and communist and you know, we can't take care of ourselves, so we should all be assimilated. And his plan for assimilating us was getting rid of the Indian Act, um, doing away with treaties, and breaking up the reserves by introducing individual fee, uh, fee simple ownership. When he writes his second book, he says in his second book, you know, my ideas have evolved. This really isn't about my agenda. This is about First Nations agenda. And he, he tries to fool people into thinking he's, introducing something new and so what he's talking about is breaking up reserve lands and giving them to individual first nations people in fee simple so the same kind of land holding you would have if you lived in a province so that they can it can be sold to non-indians yeah. and so that that's his plan and indian affairs has taken that plan and run with it and according to tom flanagan he has personally seen the legislation and it's already drafted. So you want to talk about not having any First Nation input. That's what, yeah. what's happening under the First Nation Property Ownership Act. But you know what? You, I'm sure, of all people know exactly where this original idea comes from. And it comes from the Dawes Act in the United yeah. States where they forcibly uh, brought individual ownership uh, for each of the, the different territories in the, in the states belonging to First Nations, and it devastated their land holdings. They lost yeah. millions of treaty lands in addition to other bits of their traditional territory that they can never get back. Because there's one thing about Canada and the U.S. Once your property goes into third party, as far as Canada and the U.S. are concerned, it's sorry, it's not accessible anymore. Yeah. And so that's exactly what they want to happen here, and they're counting on the fact that people won't understand what's actually hidden in that act. Yeah. You know, the, the, the bad thing I see there is, um, of course, just in the title itself, ownership. Any Native, I don't care if you're assimilated or not, we understand that we do not own the land. The land owns us. So just in its own title with this ownership. But to, but to reiterate what I was going to get to was um, – you know, all of a sudden you're going to give poverty, a member in poverty, some land. It's going to feel good to them. It is. It's going to feel good that I own this. You can never take it from me. But then, you know, in the back scheme of things, then comes the non-native who's going to offer someone money, money that they've never even heard or seen before in their life for that piece of land. So you're absolutely right. It's selling off our native land. Well, and it's the only land that we have left. There's an ulterior motive here, and what Harper wants to do is lay pipelines across our territory, expand the tar sands, um, and the best way to do that without any interference from First Nation leaders or community members is to, ha to buy their way across the country. So if you can lay your Enbridge pipeline across 20 communities, by not mm -hmm. having to deal with the community, but just by buying off individual parcels of land, you circumvent yeah. all the Aboriginal rights, the treaty rights, the duty to consult, and all of the due compensation 
right? And they can go mm-hmm. ahead and destroy your property. So let's just say only five people in your community, you know, have individual parcels of land and decide to sell it. Well, what about the rest of the community that's divided by an expanding tar sands and which, which right. impacts everybody else? And right. the other thing yes, about right. it is, is this. Um, the proponents, so Manny Jules of the First Nations Tax Commission and uh, Tom Flanagan and the federal government are saying, listen, this is going to give First Nations underlying title to their reserve lands. What, why on earth wouldn't they want that? And you want to know how they get this alleged title? They oh. have to absolutely and unconditionally surrender all of their reserve lands, all of the Aboriginal title, treaty rights, Aboriginal rights, inherent rights that all go with that, transfer it to the federal government, and then the federal government will transfer back federal government title, which is far less than what our original title is. How is that a bonus in any way? You know, I shake my head and say, and why, why now do they want to make it legal to steal land? They didn't, they didn't make it legal before to steal it. You know, so this is all just more stealing of the land, of the small portions of land that our First Nations and their communities have to live on. Yeah, and, and here's the other thing. Think about the divide and conquer, conquer tactic, Russ. So I'm, I'm mm-hmm. a lawyer, so I'm always trying to figure out what are they trying to do under their own laws. And right. think about this. So part of their plan is they're going to take certificates of possession under the Indian Act, which are like fee simple holding. So an individual gets to have a little plot of land on reserve in a house, uh, the, and they can you know, buy it, sell it, trade it, lease it, whatever they want. They just can't sell it to non-Indians. So it's very similar to fee simple in a province. But what they propose to do under this act is transfer all certificates of possession into fee simple. So individual ownership like under the province. Now, the first thing people should know is not all First Nations use certificates of possession. But for every single one that does, not everybody on reserve gets a certificate. Right? In some, right. most of the reserve is chopped up by certificates of possession, but in others, only a couple of leaders have certificates of possession. So if they transfer those certificates of possession into individual ownership, what happens to everybody else who doesn't have one? Are they screwed out of getting a piece of land? And then worse than that, what about the half of the population that lives off reserve? Right. Because the housing list was too big or they couldn't get a plot of land. I, do they get screwed out of land too? And they haven't thought through any of the legal logistics of how this would work in any kind of fair and equitable way. And it certainly takes us so far away from the collective nature of our land holdings that it's bound to cause pro- problems and disputes between indiv- even individual family members. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's the divisions being brought in. Me and you spoke about the education on another show of yep. our First Nations children. So this First Nation Educational Act, I think, would be something good. Tell me it is, Pam. <laughs> well, I'm Captain Bring Down today because the First Nation <laughs> Education Act is really an act meant to nationalize First Nation education, incorporate provincial models, standards, and laws, and it's an illusion that it'll be optional. So they're trying to promote this legislation as being optional, but it's not. What it is, it's the only game in town. So your choice here, and it's a false choice, but this is the choice they're presenting to First Nations, is one, you get to stick with the current Indian Act model of schools on reserve, which is chronically underfunded, all of your schools are falling apart, and that kind of thing. Or you can opt into this First Nation Education Act, and your funding will be tied to national First Nation education, where other provinces and treaty organizations can be telling you what your models and standards are. So think about it in terms of how we're organized as nations. Why on earth would the Mi'kmaq want the Mohawk to be telling them what their priorities should be? And likewise, why would the Mohawk want the Haida telling them what their priorities should be? It's this kind of colonial mentality that we're all just one big group of Indians and you know, the same size fits all. And what's kind of most problematic about this is this is what the AFN agreed to with 
Harper and was promoting. And you'll be interested to know at the last Special Chiefs Assembly on Education, the chiefs there in attendance unanimously voted down any First Nation education legislation, despite the fact that that's what AFN had agreed to with Harper. <laughs> you know, I've been I've been following you for a while, Pam, and um, <laughs> these aren't new things. These are things you've been speaking about for the last few years. You have been bringing this to the forefront for the last couple of years of me following you, and you've been speaking on this all along. And it may have been one of the reasons that you decided to run for national chief, and we're going to get to that. But before we get to that, let's beat the shit out of Bill 428. <laughs> let's start there. Tell okay, us what well, 428 is in, in your words, because you bring a clarity yeah. to things, and that's why we okay. love having you on the show. Well, the – the um for any listeners who aren't familiar with, you know, what's kind of happened historically in Canada, uh, it's not unlike the United States where uh, the colonial governments have had a, an assimilatory agenda. So they've, they've, I mean, their policies have all been focused around two primary objectives. One, to access Indigenous lands and resources, and two, to reduce their financial obligations to Indigenous people. And that you know they accomplish that through every manner possible. So think of smallpox, scalpings, forced sterilizations, residential schools. You name it. If there was a way to eliminate our people, they did. But then when physical extermination became less and less um, available as a, a very public option, they moved towards legislative assimilation. So think of the Indian Act and what I wrote in my book, how. There's an extinction date for, for each First Nation based on the second generation cutoff rule. Well, the 1969 white paper here in Canada was uh, a statement on the future of Indian policy by then Prime Minister um, Pierre Trudeau. And the idea was to incorporate or integrate or assimilate First Nations into the Canadian population by getting rid of Indians, getting rid of the Indian Act, breaking up reserves, and doing away with treaties. Okay? That was unanimously rejected and, you know, very boisterously rejected by First Nations across the country. And Harold Cardinal out west wrote a red paper and said, no, that's yeah, not Yeah, I was going to say the red paper. So they, you know, allegedly they dropped the white paper. But ever since then, they've been slowly trying to incrementally introduce laws and policies which will result in our assimilation. So to be assumed under provincial jurisdiction and just be Canadian citizens. And if, if you look at the collection of all of this legislation, it's obviously doing that. But Bill C-428 is, is doing just that. But it's strategic in a couple of ways because this, this legislation mandates both the amendment of the Indian Act and the repeal of the Indian Act. So you have, you know, what's, what looks almost benign at first that they're going to require that First Nations publish their bylaws. You know, so that's how this bill is described. But that, that's not what the primary motivation of this bill is. The primary motivation of this bill is to mandate that the Indian Act be repealed. And, you know, before I kind of get into the details of it, keep in mind, I am not a fan of the Indian Act. I think it's paternalistic, it's uh, colonial, racist, discriminatory, violates our sovereignty, and all of those other things. It does contain yep. some provisions in it, though, which protect our treaties, which protect our uh, reserve lands and our tax benefits that we negotiated during some of our treaties. So it's not a matter of being able to just do away with it without, without something else. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I despise the Indian Act. It is 150 years. It's 150 plus years old, the, most, the world's most racist legislation ever. But you're right. There are things in there that we use to protect ourselves. We've learned to use the law in our favor on certain issues of the Indian Act. So I'm not no fan of the Indian Act either, and it needs to go away. But it needs to go away in the understanding of First Nations coming forward and replacing it, not a government who has colonized, genocide. Yep. Exactly. And continue to we oppress always replace it. People. 
yeah, we'll replace it when we want it, how we want it, and in, in what place. I mean, I'm, I'm a sovereigntist, so I'm happy for it to go away. We, we can stand on the strength of our government. But there's other First Nations who are in different scenarios who don't feel uh, quite ready to get rid of the Indian Act, given what would happen. So under right. Canadian law, if they got rid of that Indian Act and there was no kind of recognition in Canadian law, then all the provincial laws apply. So then you're really yeah. in a contest of which laws apply, federal or provincial, when it should be our indigenous laws that are applying. And so this is exactly what's happening under this act. The MP the, uh, who's putting forward this private member's bill, Rob Clark from Saskatchewan, he is proposing to decrease the application of the act to off-reserve members. So what does that do? What that does is it transfers federal jurisdiction and responsibility and funding to the provinces for off-reserve band members, and they're doing that without consultation. There's, a, there's provisions under the Indian Act for special reserves. Special reserves were no, will no longer be considered reserve lands, so no tax exemptions, no constitutional protection or anything like that. And that's just unilateral. It what is a special re reserve? Sorry? What is a it's special just a, reserve? It's just a category of reserve. Um, okay. You know, so there's reserves that are set up, you know, via treaties, and there's reserves that are set up under the Indian Act and agreements okay. and that kind of thing. And then there's, right. special, you know, there's urban reserves, special reserves. So, um, okay. But the other thing it does is, it repeals the estate's provisions. So estates talks about um, wills. What happens to your property when you die? Does it go to your mom, your dad, your kids, your auntie, that kind of thing, right? So it just repeals them. It doesn't do anything else. And what happens when you repeal those estate's provisions is it will, it will create a vacuum and a provincial jurisdiction will come in and determine all of the wills and estates. But the thing it does is it kind of only does it half-assed because it leaves in all the intestacy provisions, which means if you don't have a will, then there's an automatic formula for what can happen. It will make it literally impossible for people to know what's going to happen to their property on their death. Should they make a will? Should they not make a will? Is it going to be federal or provincial? And it's going to be different all across the country because, you know, provinces and territories have different laws and different case laws. So it, it actually creates a mess instead of resolving anything. And then just randomly, he removes the power of First Nations to make bylaws with regards to intoxicants. So you know how some First Nations have bylaws to say we're having a dry reserve, no alcohol can be sold on this reserve? Mm -hmm. They're not allowing First Nations to have that bylaw anymore. Huh. Which, I mean, I, I still, for the life of me, can't think of why the heck that was what would be stuck in there. And, of course, they have to publish their bylaws. But the ultimate objective of this act, which is stated right in the act, is to mandate Canada and First Nations to repeal the Indian Act. So it's purporting to do something that legislatively it doesn't have the power to do. It's requiring the government and First Nations meet and requiring them negotiate their way out of the Indian Act. And, I mean, that's kind of the, the nitty-gritty of, of the bill. But what's really interesting is how he's actually looking at, or how he's actually considering this bill. So what he's saying is that he's on a broad consultative process. Now, Rob Clark identifies himself as a, I think he says he's Métis from Saskatchewan, and that he has a RCMP law enforcement background, so he knows how important this stuff is. So the people he's consulting with are non-First Nation Canadians, businesses, Métis people, non-status Indians that live off-reserve, and off-reserve band members. He's done almost no on-reserve consultations whatsoever. And... Something that's really glaring is because he's saying that this whole bill is about consultation. He had the nerve to come to the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations Legislative Assembly, and I was in attendance, present this bill and said that he was going to save First Nations 
And when he was done his little spiel about how this is good for us and will lift us out of poverty, he refused to take a single question from any of the First Nation leaders there and left. Yeah. That is not by any standard consultation. You know, the, the, the First Nations don't need another savior. No. <gasps> they don't need a savior. What the First Nations need is common sense, and they need to invoke sovereignty. And this totally yeah. walks in the opposite direction of doing just that. It creates exactly. an illusion of divisions, fighting, bring alcohol back to the reserve. You know, it's, it's, it's the devastation all over again with the modernization um, appeal to it. How do you go in to remove or to alter or to eliminate certain sections of anything without, call, without, call, without consultating with people? And it's Agreed. Um, Pam, it I looks like Russ dropped off for a moment, so he'll call right back in. So just go ahead and uh, keep talking, and and I'm sure he'll yeah, call right no. back in. Okay. Um, I totally agree with all of that. All of these bills have a very common denominator. One is it interferes with First Nations governance in a very direct and, and detailed, manipulative kind of way. The other thing is that it's transferring jurisdiction unilaterally from the federal government to the provincial government uh, on many of these, uh, you know, across many of these sectors. And it also does something else pretty significant, is that the federal government is also trying to dump a lot of its high liability areas. So if you look at contaminated lands, contaminated waters, and uh, lack of sanitation, that's one of the kind of high litigation liability areas. I mean, they stand to be liable for billions of dollars. The last thing they want is people starting to get a whiff of that kind of liability. And because of all of the discussion lately around uh, First Nation water and water systems and and people being aware of the housing crisis and contaminated land, what they're trying to do is dump the majority of their liability. But if you, if you, you've got to kind of look at how all of these acts work together. You know, it's going to lead to more imprisonment of our people, more for, uh, Indian Affairs control, and then eventually what's going to happen is that um, all of these laws will lead to First Nations being under provincial jurisdiction, and if you think of kind of the worst one, like Bill S-2, uh, matrimonial real property, which will uh, give our reserve lands to non-Indians, coupled with First Nation Property Ownership Act, where non-Indians can buy reserve lands, then you've got this kind of massive breakup of First Nations. And it's really no consolation that First Nations are going to have alleged underlying title, because what you will have is uh, a First Nation with a band office completely surrounded by non-Indians. What, what kind of nation is that? So you get to collect, tax or, you know, collect taxes from a few non-Indians. That's not what a nation's all about. If your people are dispersed all over the country and not even on their own traditional territory. So think about the implications of that. And I just think First Nation, many First Nations and especially community members. That's the one that really disturbs me the most, is that they're not aware of what's happening. And so if they're not aware, how can, how can they exercise their voice or ensure that their leaders represent their voice in all of this? And that's really problematic. No, you make a very good point there. You know, prior to colonization, you know, you know as well as I do, we were ran by a clan, some other system. Um, it was in colonization that we that that we got the word chief. You know, our, our our people follow leaders. Chief is not our word; it's their word. And then we come to this. I don't even know what to call it. We come to this this um, form of government or, or, or this form of community where one person is the speaker of all. It's not traditional. It's not custom. It's not traditional. It has nothing to do with natives. So 
So the assimilation, in my view, has already taken place even within our reserves themselves. Um, I guess the point I'm trying to get to is when do, when do we get our voice back? When do we actually get to speak? When do our leaders actually carry the majority voice with them? And when does our national leader get elected or put into position by the people and not by Indian Act Chiefs? Well, I think, I mean, it, it's really hard to generalize because there are many, many leaders who work really well with their communities. Uh, we only ever hear about right. the bad ones, but there are mm-hmm. lots that take all of their direction. Um, they do all of the traditional ceremonies around what they do. They have limited powers and that kind of thing. But I yeah. think if if you're going to talk about it in a general way, that nobody is going to give us anything. Canada is not going to give us our sovereignty. We have to live, act on it, and assert it. And it's the same with the, the voices of the people at the community level. We have to assert it. If we keep waiting for someone to give it to us, it's never going to happen. That's not to say mm-hmm. it's going to be easy. But we, we always have to, I mean, because we're sovereign as individuals, too. Like, I'm a sovereign Mi'kmaq individual, just like my nation. The Mi'kmaq nation is, is uh, sovereign. But if we don't act on it, then, then all we're doing is sitting around asking for Canada to give us a few self-government powers. And that's not what our ancestors died for. They died defending our sovereignty, and we have an obligation to protect it for our future generations. Even if we don't want it, we don't get to make that decision. That's for our community members and our future generations. Yep. You know, there's, um, there's also some, some areas or, or some sections of the index that they're looking to repeal completely, not replace it with nothing, just take it completely out. Let's talk about some of those. Um, like Section 42, 42 to 47. Oh, where, yeah. So, we uh, have to, so or, what I did without mentioning all the sections is I kind of already went through those specific provisions. But mm-hmm. there's also the there, – don't forget there's also the omnibus bills. Like this is just – talk. what we've talked about today is just the legislation that is specific to First Nations. But there's several right. omnibus bills which, which uh, really impact our rights, too. So if you think of Bill C-45, which I think they're going to be looking at next week, it's an omnibus bill. And what they're doing is within hundreds of pages of amendments to hundreds of pieces of legislation all over the country, they're sneaking in amendments to the Indian Act that will purport to change uh, reserve land holdings on reserve, how they can be surrendered and that kind of thing, which, of course, is a direct violation of you know, treaties, Section 35, Indigenous laws, and, and the whole gambit. And that, but it's in an omnibus bill, so we don't even get to present on an omnibus bill. The best I can do is write a letter, which I've done, but, you know, uh, other First Nations are writing a letter too, but it's, these omnibus bills are really just, you know, it's a violation of Canada's own, you know, alleged democratic principles. This isn't about a government, you know, by the people, for the people. This is a Harper dictatorship, and we've got to do something about it. Or it's not just going to be impacting First Nations. Canadian citizens aren't going to get off scot-free on this one either. Hmm. Yeah, it's still moving forward of corporate business, and that's, and, and, and that's what we continue to see, along with the devastation of our First Nations and now taking away any... Any rights, you know, taking away any, any right that you thought you had. It's it's the division. It's coming in and and opening up our First Nations for mainstream society to come in. Yep, but here's we're no here's longer a twist. people. Yeah, so just like you know, people can't give us our sovereignty. We have to live on it, act on it, assert it, and protect it every day. The same thing. People can't take anything from us unless we let them. And I know that's a bit, you know, that's hard because so many of our people are suffering, right? But there's there's lots of us that can stand behind those people and say, no, we're not going to let it happen. But we have to make that decision. And so far, the AFN has done zero. They haven't even, they've been too scared to even be critical of the federal government. Meanwhile, you know, they're only just coming to the realization this week that, quote, you know, the... um, 
some of this legislation has the potential to do harm. Like, honest to goodness, if they're that far behind in their thinking and don't see it, we're, we're, we're in a lot of trouble if we rely on the AFN solely. I think we have to act as sovereign nations and defend ourselves and stand up for what's ours. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what is AFN? What is the AFM saying at this point, Pam? Well, other than other than there's there it's tentative to her. What is their plan of action at this point that you're seeing? Well, I mean, it's a it's a plan of action uh, that was recently noted in the media this this past week. That's basically saying here's the solution to all of this. One, we need a First Nation auditor, a national First Nation <laughs> auditor, and that's just yeah. you couldn't get any Another more. Another Indian agent. Yeah, it will. And what? What First Nation in Manitoba wants a First Nation auditor or a First sure. Nation without a school? Nobody wants any of that stuff. And, you know, it, their, their, their kind of focus is around Section 35. Let's see how well we can negotiate our Section 35 rights. And they're ignoring what's happening around us. So it's, so far they haven't really come up with any plan at all. I don't see anything for the people. Like, what about the people who are suffering? You know, and like you've already pointed out at the beginning of the show, this money is already audited. You must show where every penny is spent or you're not getting a dime next year. So, once again, creating another position to take more money, to pay for more holidays, to pay for more retirements, it's ridiculous. How many more times can you divide the pie? And that's what it breaks down to. It continually steals money from our nations by employing non-natives to overlook us. It's ridiculous. So, Pam, you ran a very, 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 very intensive campaign for National Chief in July, and we watched you. We followed you, we watched you, and you have gained a lot of support, so much so, being the first woman to ever run for National Chief. There were two others running along with you, but... This is the first time that women ever ran. You came in a strong second, knowing that BC chiefs were going to put Alto back in Avio back into office. So, yeah. with BC chiefs out of the equation, and Pam Palmater is now our national chief, what would you have done differently, or what would you be doing now? Um, well, uh, just a small correction. Um, we, other women had run before. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Roberta Jameson, Marilyn Buffalo, and Delia Opikik had run before. Um, and there was four that ran this time around. But, um, okay. yeah, no, I, I came in second, so I had 141 votes. And, um, you know, I was I was happy with that. I was trying to make a very clear message that, you know, we're at war and we have to defend ourselves. The status quo is killing our people. And if they think for a minute that voting for the status quo is going to save them, the status quo has changed, and it's going to get much worse by Harper's doing. So even the status quo doesn't offer any security anymore. And, of course, post-election, what do you see? Massive, massive funding cuts to First Nations organizations, the reinvigoration of all of this legislation, devastating omnibus bills, a refusal to negotiate comprehensive claims. I mean, you name it, they have done everything. It's essentially a full blitz attack. And that, yeah. and they, they fully expect that we're not going to respond. So, I mean, I, I'm hoping at some point in time AFN will respond, but I guess looking back it's kind of hard to be, you know, what would I have done if? But I think... Had I been elected, my, my first thing would have been to have an emergency strategy session with, you know, not just the regional chiefs, but the grand chiefs and other, you know, chiefs that are working really hard in their First Nations to kind of plot out a strategic action plan on where we go from here and then engage with the actual people on the ground. You know, what are their priorities? Is the priority of First Nation auditor or is it to deal with the, the flooding victims in Manitoba or the murder to missing Aboriginal women? And so it's, it would really have been the focus would have been on a strategic action plan so that we went to the government with here's, here's where it starts and ends. This is the plan. This is the agreement. 
we're putting this on the table, we're no longer responding to your initiative, now let's talk and, and really assert the place that we, that we have. Uh, I mean, we're, we're inherently sovereign nations and we should start acting like it. And, and that's what we should be seeing now from our national chief. We should be seeing that. Yes, if I had my wish list. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. What's next, Pam? What do you see if this all becomes? What's next? If um, all this passes and this all becomes, what do you see for our future? Well, I'm 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 trying to make a call to people to not let this pass. That the time to act is now. That all of this stuff is very imminent. We're not even talking about what will happen in 20 to 30 years. We're talking about imminent funding cuts, imminent uh, legislative control and destruction of our communities, and 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 you know imminent complete usage of all of our resources. And if we don't deal with it now, it's going to be a thousand times harder to deal with the disaster afterwards. Trying to get legislation repealed or amended can take up to 25 years in a court of law. We don't have that sort of time. No. Our people are dying, and we need to deal with this stuff now. And I think we'll be much stronger if you know our leaders and our community members can reconnect again and act on their sovereignty and stop waiting for the AFN to, to do something about it. It would be great if they did, but if they can't, right. then we have to step up. How much time do you think we have, Pam? Uh, well, we've been on for, what, two hours? No, no. How much time do you think before... Because um, I know they're going November 28th into into their session, and they're going to read oh. it for the second time and debate this. How much time do we have if, let's say if, all this is implemented, how much time do we have? No time. We need to no act time. now. Yeah, no time. And so, you know, I've been working with First Nations and community members across the country, stressing this urgency, um, coming up with strategic action plans and that kind of thing, and... So hopefully these will all start rolling out very soon because we I don't know how many times I can say it but we just have to take action. It just talking to the government is not going to do anything. Harper's no friend of ours and he's made that very yeah. clear. He keeps taking shots across the bow and we just stand there and that's not what our warriors do. Our warriors stand up for our people. Yeah. Um I don't know if you've been seeing. We did a radio show with Frank Bush um, from the Cree Nation, um, who is dealing with uh, the residential school um, disputes and settlements and um, things like that. Um, he's now moved on to take a different position within his own community. But he was he he came on the show and he was speaking about how with these cuts that the First Nations are seeing, ironically, fall within the same numbers of what it's costing for the TRC. Do you have any view on that? Well, I think, I mean, what what you're raising is a very, very important issue, and you have to look at it all across the board. So not just the TRC, but everything. So think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the specific claims tribunal, all of these things that they're giving, it looks like they're giving First Nations new money for, so economic Mm -hmm. development programs, new organizations, so if they set up a new organization for the First Nation property ownership, a new education organization, a new auditor, where does all of that money come from? I mean, we all know there's more than enough money in Canada to to provide adequate funding to First Nations, but they don't. But every time they ask for something like that, it comes from the people. Look at what happened to Attawapiskat, right? Um, They they didn't give new money to Attawapiskat. They just took that out of the budget. And it's the same with the First Nation education legislation that they talked about this, or the the funding that they talked about this year. They claimed to be giving something like 267 million new dollars in education. First of all, it's not new money, and that was over five years, whereas the previous amount, which is much larger, over three years. So it's it's really. Uh, a shell game when it comes to the federal government. And I'm not just saying that in terms of rhetoric. If you look at the Auditor General's um, uh, financial audits over Indian Affairs, they have caught Indian Affairs in lies. Indian Affairs will report to um, Parliament that they've 
increased the number of houses on First Nations, doubled the money that they've spent on housing, and so there shouldn't be a housing problem. But when the Auditor General looks at the numbers, she finds not only has it not increased, that that was a complete falsity, but in fact, the, all of the funding and the number of houses have gone down significantly. So it's no surprise that we're in a we're in a housing crisis whatsoever, and it's no surprise that the public doesn't know what's going on because they lie to Parliament. So let me ask you a question. Why are they not held legally responsible in the positions they hold? <sighs> Wouldn't that be great if they were yeah, held would legally be. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I guess people can only wish for that kind of thing, but it takes, I mean, who's going to do it? Right? I mean, the, the federal government is the one in control of their own military, their own police forces. I mean, Harper has a vice grip control on all of his MPs and his cabinet. I mean, they don't do anything without the Harper government. And, I mean, that's even clear with the Minister of Indian Affairs. The Minister of Indian Affairs doesn't come up with any ideas on his own, can't, can barely speak on his own most times, this clearly comes from the center about what's going to happen, and the Minister of Indian Affairs um, does good just not to blubber things up when he's in the media and, and make misstatements, which he often does. Those misstatements kind of show the real truth of what's, of what's actually happening on the ground. So with that being said, Pam, how could we ever, ever ever think that there's any justice for First Nations treaties and our sovereign rights in Canada? How, how could there well, ever be? Uh, clearly, clearly, clearly there isn't any justice right now. And I think our job, which seems unfair to you know burden our people with even more things to do, but our job is to make sure that Canadians know that and the world knows that. Not because I'm naive enough to think that when all people know better, all people do better, because to be quite honest, some people benefit very heavily by our dispossession and by maintaining us in poverty. But there are a large number of Canadians and in the international community who, who when faced with blatant injustices, are sometimes compelled to act. And I think part of what we need to do is to continue having these fact-based discussions, so not the kind of rhetoric arguments back and forth, but fact-based and say, okay, let's put all this stuff on the table and see where everything lands. Because if you just look at the fact that Canada keeps First Nations in poverty, I mean, they have to work really hard to make sure that their laws and policies keep First Nations in poverty. It doesn't yeah. even make economic sense. So if you're purely just a money guy and all you care about is getting rich, well, you're going to get richer a lot faster and in many more ways by removing all of those barriers for First Nations than actually keeping them in place. Because I think we might have discussed on your show before the fact that you know, it, it costs $100,000 to keep one Aboriginal man in a federal penitentiary for one year. Yet... For a four-year education in university, that's less than 60 grand. So not only are you having a savings of 40 grand, but you're increasing the likelihood that this individual is not going to end up in jail, is not going to end up uh, relying on um, social programs, and will be able to provide for himself and his family and, and, and so forth. Um, but, but we keep making... And when I say we, I mean Canada keeps making economically stupid decisions. And I'm, and I'm only saying, not that these are only economic decisions to make, but it's, it makes no sense. And I mean, Cindy Blackstock is, is really good about sharing the facts with the public and saying for every $1 you spend on a First Nations child in social programs, you save $7 down the road. Right, So if you're providing funds for language and culture and education and health and you know all of those things that most Canadians take for granted, then you're saving $7 down the road. How many kinds of investments can say that? 
Yeah. But in First Nations, in First Nations, like people can only think out of their you know greedy mind. Well, does this mean I have to share my land? Well, does this mean I have to share some of the lobster licenses? Well, does this mean I have to, you know, sacrifice something? And it's it's just insane. And I mean, if you look, want to look at the huge numbers, if we just eliminated the gap in education, and I just mean mainstream education. Uh, between First Nations and Canadians, that would bring back $179 billion in gross domestic product for Canada. Why on earth would we not invest those few million dollars now to have such a significant and substantial return later? And, you know, some of the arguments that we get are that, well, treaty rights and land claims are too expensive. But even non-Indigenous economists have looked at all of those arguments and discounted them. There's a report from PricewaterhouseCoopers that specifically says that the longer you delay resolving treaties and claims, the more it costs. But the quicker you do it, not only do you, you know, um, save on all of those costs from the delay, but everybody gets wealthier faster, First Nations and non-First Nations. So it, there's just under any sector, it doesn't matter, housing, food, water, education, law, governance, the more we, you know, Canada forces First Nations into poverty and keeps them there, the more everybody suffers. See, now you would think in what you just explained that that thinking of moving a nation forward, because that's what leaders do. It's a, it's, a, it's a call to duty, not a step up in power for any leader of any nation. So to be called to duty, you would think that that would, that would be the direction in which you move your nation to prosper, to become better in the future. But that ain't what we're seeing done here. What we're seeing is, is a dummy down society who is educated on lies instead of truth, because certainly, Pam, the truth would end the hatred of prejudice, discrimination, and racism. Certainly it had to if you, taught it, if you taught the truth. And that would end that. But instead, we're going down a direction of selling off the resources of Canada, of the lands of Canada, to China. Mm-hmm. So it's not just these acts coming out, and it's not this bill, and it's not this, and it's not that. It's, it's all of it. How do you mobilize the people to fight all 12 sides? Of what we see. Well, and I think you just raised something that's really important because I've been saying all along, you know, when I speak in Canada, hey, listen, uh, this isn't just impacting First Nations. This will also impact Canadians. Stephen Harper's agenda is not in anybody's best interest, but a few, you know, elite corporate oil business people. What what Harper is planning to do with the Canada-China Free Trade Agreement is essentially allow China to be the decision maker about what happens with our resources on our territory. And if we do anything, like if Canada does anything to try to interfere with China's rights, China has the right to set up a uh, a dispute resolution mechanism in China with only people from China to decide whether or not Canada is in breach of this agreement and then can decide what the compensation should be. Like, in what, in what world would we consider an agreement like that to be anything less than, you know, traitorous of, of Canada? He, you know, when first would, of all, he doesn't have right. Italy first of all, allow Spain? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, like, when did we as First Nations ever give the, up the right to our lands and resources such that right. he thinks he can go and give away those resources? But even if we had, he doesn't have that right on behalf of Canadians to do that. And here's the other clincher. If Canadians dare speak out against this or protest or, or try to do anything against China, Canada has an obligation under that agreement to stop them. So China will be completely protected over for our resources. It it makes no sense whether you're First Nation or Canadian, and I think Canadians need to wake up to that. 
Yep. You know, it's and, not and only actually, it's on the U.S. side, too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, and just in terms of a resource, David Suzuki on his website has a really good resource about the implications of that agreement because it's another big it's a big confusing agreement and most people aren't going to read it, but he really breaks it down about what, what the potential is. Yeah. I, you know, the question still remains in my head, you know, because I'm, I like to think of myself as a person who brings solutions. So whenever I hear of an issue, I think it out. What would I do? And I look to see what the projected outcome is going to be. I don't see one here. I see devastation. You know, so the question remains, how do we mobilize the members of First Nations? Educate them and mobilize them when there's no time left. What do we do? Well, I I think that's exactly it. We need to share information quickly and efficiently. We need to educate um, First Nation community members about what's happening just as just as much as their leaders. There are just as many like First Nation leaders who contact me and say, "What the heck does this bill mean?" Just like <laughs> you know, their community members. So we're like we're all in this together. This isn't member versus leader or anything like that. This is we're in this together. And I think it's, but it's going to take more of us doing that very quickly. And I think you know there's already work in progress. So that's the kind of stuff that you don't share with the public, right? There's strategic right. planning going on behind the scenes. There's plans being had, um, ideas on how to get you know everybody coordinated. Because the fact of the matter is we live in an age where it's very easy. It's much easier to coordinate than it was a long time ago. But look at what mm-hmm. happened with the 1969 white paper when they tried to assimilate us out of existence without cell phones and pagers and social media and all that, we were able to nationally coordinate, mobilize, and defend ourselves against that and say, no, it's not going to happen, and we defeated it. You're right. And that's not the, you know, that's not the only time, if, if, you know, when you look at it. Look at the First Nations Governance Act. They were going to try to do what some of these, you know, amendments are doing now, and we collectively, I mean, there were some dissidents, but we, the majority said absolutely not, and so it didn't happen. And we just have to have faith in our power to do that. And, you know, and this isn't just something for adults. Look at youth. You know, Shannon Kostachin from Attawapiskat First Nation brought the world's attention to Canada and the crisis of no housing and, and no school at Attawapiskat all by herself. You know, she was a little girl, and she made a video for YouTube, and she, she managed to then, you know, become, kind of become the symbol for advocating for First Nations schools. And, you know, may she rest in peace. She has left a very significant legacy. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be a lawyer. You don't have to be a politician. And you certainly don't have to wait for AFN. We have the power within us. We've used it before, and we can use it again. We just have to help inspire other people to to take action. And, you know, inspiration, you, you want it to come from leaders, but right now we have a few too many politicians and not enough leaders, but we do have yep. some good leaders. And I think our leaders really have to focus on inspiring our people to take action, to want to take action, to want to protect our First Nations and our land, territories, treaties, our inherent rights and sovereignty, and, and all everybody be a part of it to see what their role is. One of the things... Um well, before I go to that question, uh, before I go to that statement, let me. Um, there's a lot of debates out there right now, Pam. A lot of debates on this. So, in what you're hearing, or what you're seeing, or what you're viewing, who's on our side? Anyone on um, our side? Are we fighting this alone? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I, I mean, I think the majority of community members feel the same way about you know something's got to give, because <laughs> when you think yeah. about it, it's the community members who are on the front lines. Who's going to be the one without running water? It's the person in the community. You know, who's going to be displaced by flooding? It's the person in the community. 
you know, all the people that, you know, live and work in Ottawa, for the most part, are insulated from that. Um, many of us uh, who are in different positions are also, you know, don't have to deal with that. I don't have to worry tomorrow that I'm going to be displaced from flooding. So for every privilege that we all have as Indigenous peoples, we have to stand up for those who are on the front lines taking the hits right now. And not just First Nations. There's lots of leaders who are on side. And more and more, I must say, more and more First Nation leaders have are kind of reaching their point. But I think Canadians as well. There are organizations who have historically been sympathetic and on our side, and I think more and more are. Um, you think of some you know, environmental groups who've had good relationships with First Nations and some who haven't, but there are some who have. Uh, you think of justice organizations, amnesty, there are some UN organizations. I mean, we just we can build on, on those allies uh, in society. I can tell you those allies are very, very important, as you know and you may not know. I work out, I sit on the board of directors for Whisper and Thunder, and we have a lot of initiatives that we do. Education is one of them, of course, and uh, our health initiative dealing with diabetes. Um, right now we run our program for EREZ, where we have sponsorship. Uh, we raise funds and we bring propane into the homes of our Native brothers and sisters so that they no longer have to huddle around the open stove in one room anymore. Um, so in saying that, I, I, I agree with you there. We have a tremendous support of non-Natives on both sides of the border. So I think when we talk about rallying and getting going and moving, because we have no time left, it will take all four directions to do so. Yeah. So just in what you explained and what I deal with in the nonprofit and see the, the tremendous support come in to bring heat into homes is astronomical, and you're absolutely right. And I'm glad you, you hit that point. This isn't Native against non-Native. These are, these are human being people of different cultures and beliefs fighting for what's right. And we have support on both sides. So thank you for bringing that forward. I wanted to bring positive to that, that um, we're not yeah. fighting this alone. Well, no. no, and I don't think it was ever First Nations against, you know, the settler population. It's, it's yeah. primarily First Nations against the really kind of corrupt, assimilatory government agenda, which is now, you know, very aggressive. But, you know... Yeah. That doesn't let Canadians off the hook either because no, if, they're will, if, they're, if they're willfully blind or, you know, they know what's happening and they don't do anything about it, they're equally as much a part of it. They don't have the right I to agree. say it doesn't concern us. I agree. You can't be, you, you, you can't be the opposition or the support to something wrong as you as a majority continue to put the wrong back into office. So you are responsible. Yeah, You're absolutely Yeah, right. exactly. And the same with, you know, um, all the political parties. Opposition members always pretend to be First Nations' best friends when they're in opposition. And then they get mm -hmm. power, and everything changes. Now, mind you, there's never been a government as destructive and dictatorial um, as this one. So this one is really beyond all precedent, but uh, that's Harper government. But, you know, generally, you know, if things were to change tomorrow, I, I, I wonder how much support we would have from, from whatever opposition party got in for any of the things that we're talking about, like First Nations and a recognition of our sovereignty and to kind of go away and let us, you know, my, like govern our own uh, nations and, you know, and, and to share an adequate amount of the resources and to, sh you know, give us back um, our land. And I don't mean like kick off people who are living in homes, but I mean there's tons of land available for First Nations yeah. and there's no reason on earth why we can't be given back uh, our land and resources, especially the, knowing that it would sustain us into perpetuity. Mm -hmm. Well, I tell you, as fast as churches are closing down across Canada, I think there's an op there's an ample opportunity right there to start taking back land, or, or for it to be given back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so you know, I had to kick religion, didn't you, Pam? <laughs> 
We got, we, we, what did we get? An hour and 27 minutes into it, you knew I was going to kick religion before it was over with. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, um, well, that's all I'm going to do because this show is about what we're facing and it has nothing to do about um, <clears throat> about the truth. <laughs> well, so, um, I mean, the, the truth is relative, right? Uh, my yeah. goal is just to have fact-based discussions and we can leave all the theory you. and philosophizing and stuff for, you know, those who prefer that, but this is about fact-based discussions and how to move forward. Absolutely. Hey, I've been reading articles lately, too, and um, see if you have a view on this one. Um, not very many. So I want to know if it's true or if it's propaganda, that now that Harper has his minions lined up and he's got full control, that now they're starting to, it's starting to bicker within themselves, and there may be some cracks in their wall. Any truth to that, or is it propaganda? Well, I'm not a part of that inner circle, but, you know, mm-hmm. there's lots of rumors abounding now, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. I think but it everybody, could be propaganda every, too, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's only so far a dictator can push people before you're, and, you know, cracks are going to happen. And, you know, we've been hearing rumors about cracks in cabinet as well, especially on Harper's. Um, Canada-China agreement and some of the omnibus bills. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe Harper will be his own undoing, and wouldn't that be amazing? But we we can't kind of sit around and, and just hope and that happens. That, right? so, yeah, exactly. We still have to take action, and, and I, I, I certainly don't trust anybody in Cabinet either. I mean, they don't have our right. best interests at first. Right. You know, the same on, you know, I, I don't live in Canada, I live on the U.S. side, so I, I I take that with the grain of salt that it came with that you're absolutely right. We we don't trust our government here either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I am First Nations, but I but I but I have been assimilated into society um by by reasons um of a factual proof that's happened to the past to our people. But regardless I, I do live on the US side and uh, I, I see the same thing on the US side too. So I don't know. I don't know when people are going to wake up. You know, it's it's got to come to a point where this has nothing to do anywhere about Native, has nothing to do with about Black, has nothing to do with about Italian, has nothing to do with about Asian. It has to do about humanity. And we continue to see laws that 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 dissect and separate and pull us away from the true meaning, and the true meaning is our connection to all living things. So as we continue to see in this type of governments on both sides of this border and around the world, we continue to see something geared towards capitalism, greed, at all cost. The problem is at all cost is the livelihood of the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and humanity itself. So I don't know where we're heading, Pam, or what's going to happen in the future. You know, I I shake my head. Well, I would not want to be a youth today. <sighs> The future is well, so uncertain. Um, I think I think what you're doing is really great that you're providing me with, you know, this hour and a half to kind of talk about all of these issues, and it, you know, it'll probably leave people with, you know, different things to think about, and you know, if they want to look up the legislation or send questions or that kind of thing. But I think, you know, that that's that kind of hour and a half is is you know really important because usually what you get on the media is five minutes. And it is impossible yeah. to explain the real implications of anything in five minutes. So, I, you know, I just want to, before I sign off here, I just want to mm-hmm. thank you so much for providing this 90 minutes, which is huge, to kind of talk about these issues. And, you know, hopefully if people have questions, they can send me emails and that kind of thing. Absolutely. Once again, you can get a hold of Pam I'm at indigenousnationhood.blogspot.com. You want to keep up on her writings, that's where she puts it all. She lays it out for you. Once again, Pam, your common sense, your clarity is more than, I don't know, we're just, it just seems like every time you come on, you make it a little bit more simple for us to have a direction. And and it's it's in that face-to-face, community-to-community member talk is where where this is going to roll out from. You've always been part of the grassroots. You've always talked. You've always gave on to the grassroots. I thank you for what you do. And, sister, keep speaking because you're right. The silence is killing us. We're leaving. 